I would very much like to have some profound words of wisdom to share with you all this morning, to convince you of what a great Christian I am, but the truth is I don't and I'm not. Uh, the Lord put a burden on my heart a while back. He actually made it very clear to me if I was ever to be lay minister again and stand before you, my church family, that I had to confess a sin to you and ask your forgiveness. My response to this was, gee, Lord, I've already apologized. I've already asked your forgiveness, and I know you gave it with your grace, and I hope I've been forgiven by those I wronged. But a relationship was broken, and God doesn't speak to me audibly. Maybe he does to some of you, but when he is <coughs> laying something on my heart, it, he lays it out. It's definite. I know it. And so when he, when he laid this on my heart, I thought, well, I told him. I said, how about I go talk to, to Keith or John or somebody about this? There's no point in me humiliating myself in front of the church. He said, that's not what I said. So I said, all right, Lord, I will obey you as soon as I'm ready. <laughs> and I figured it was going to take me some time to get ready. And I mean, what's time to God, right? So I was in the process of praying over it and avoiding it and getting ready. And dadgum, if David Hampton didn't walk up to me after the meeting last Sunday, he didn't say, Jan, will you be lay minister again? He looked me straight in the face and he said, are you ready? Well, that doesn't seem very nice for God to have discussed my sin with David Hampton. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, I, I couldn't imagine that he would have done that, but that's what David said to me, are you ready? And I said, I knew what he meant, but I said, ready for what? He said to be lay minister, and I said, you know, I could have made an excuse to David, but I didn't want to just flat, boldly, flagrantly defy God. So here I am, and what I did was to respond to someone else's opinion, their position, their beliefs on social media in a way that I felt like at that moment was righteousness. I felt so good. I felt like that's not right and I don't believe it. And I responded now. I didn't respond in love. There was certainly no caring, sharing, and loving in my response. I was judgmental. I was harsh. I was mean-spirited. And I was ugly. Uh, I even went so far as to tell this person, I didn't think they lived, needed to live in Mississippi if they felt like that. I hope at least a few of you are surprised. <laughs> but that's what I did. I owe you an apology as my church family. I have apologized and want to reiterate my sincere repentance to this family that I hurt, this friend that I hurt. I did a terrible wrong, and I knew it was wrong, and I tried to delete it. I don't know what happened, but it, maybe that was part of my punishment. It would not delete. Uh, I not only embarrassed myself, you as a church family, my friends, but I hurt the heart of God, and that's the most important part of all. I've always said salvation we have to work out our own with fear and trembling. And it's five steps forward sometimes and three steps back. Well, y'all, I took 10 steps back that day. And I'm not proud of it. I'm ashamed of it. And I do humbly repent of it. And I ask you all to forgive me, and particularly those that I hurt so much. I've learned from this foolish mistake. I've learned to think before I speak. I've learned that I don't have the right to judge anybody, no matter how much I disagree with them. And with God's grace and guidance, I will strive to never 
bring shame upon myself, my church family, my friends, or my Heavenly Father again. Not in that way, anyway. I'm sure I'll still do plenty of sinning and take plenty of steps back. Thank you both. Thank you all. And thank you to your friends. Confession is good for the soul. And now we'll have our call to worship. as we share the opening sentences together. <laughs> Quiet me, O oh Lord. Calm my heart. Wow. Still my hands.
Please share the prayer. God, please slow me down so that I can hear your voice and see you at work in my life today. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing all verses of hymn 64, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Good to see you this morning. Please remain standing and let's affirm our faith together. If you're not familiar with this, turn to page 881 in the back of your hymnal as we join together in one voice affirming what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so my friend here, Jim Jimmy, as I like to call him, usually you only do it that during the weekdays, but, but you, you guys don't understand what a privilege it is for him to bring his tambourine out. <laughs> he won't do it in the 830 service. I mean, this morning, I'm sitting on the front pew. Yeah. You know, he's kind of going. Just like that, too. Yeah. Well, I can do it with the other leg. Wait. Is that why I brought it? Well, I, I just, I think you're, you're, you're hurting. You're hurting the 830 crowd because they don't get to hear the tambourine. Oh. Well, you know, uh, hey, Mr. Tambourine Man. Dylan's birthday is this week. Um, 
Do any of you ever struggle with hope? I do. Um, this week when I came in Monday and I looked through the, the lectionary passages and I, I just was struck by John's gospel and the way that Jesus is telling the disciples, you guys really can't handle this right now, so you're not really going to get it. But when you do get the Spirit, you'll know it. So John's writing about all this, you know, 65 years after it happened. And I'm not a big fan of Paul, as, as some of you know, hear me talk. But for whatever reason, that Romans passage today, he talks about endurance, building character, and then character giving you hope. Sometimes my heart is so heart-worn that hope is very hard to have. Because we like to be in control, right? I mean, when, when I played sports as a kid growing up and then some in college, I was always, I, never, I never, never got nervous, wasn't worried about anything. And then my kids started playing sports. And, you know, you're taking all these antacids and, you know, doing this, that, and the other, and screaming at the umpire and the officials and the referees, and people are telling you to sit down and shut up. But you're going, that's my kid, you know. And you want so bad for them to succeed, you hope, and you want to be able to control it. I think hope means you give up control. If you really want to experience the word that I've been caught up with this week is called transformation. If you really want to be transformed, as Paul says, by the renewing of your mind, don't let your hope be renewed. In the movie Philadelphia, Denzel Washington plays this attorney. And um, Tom Hanks' his character wants him, you know, he's dying of AIDS, and he wants him to represent him. And, and Denzel is like, nah, we're not going to do this. He, he, he refused, and he didn't really bother seeing what, what Hanks' his character was really going through. But slowly as the movie evolves, you see Denzel Washington's character evolve as well. And what initially was refusal in the end became acceptance generated by hope. Hope takes a long time. I have a saying from a movie, hope floats. Hope always floats. So keep hoping even when your heart is heart worn. Let's pray. God, calm us. Let your Spirit's presence wrap us in your love this morning. We've already had a wonderful example of what it means to, to ask forgiveness and to receive it unconditionally. But God, for your grace, we would all be the same way. Sinners we are. Forgiven we are. Teach us how to love. And teach us how to live in the Spirit so that we would be agents of change. As we remember the words your Father, the Son, taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace and peace be with you. Thanks, y'all. Please stand as we sing all verses of hymn number 144. This is my father's world.
remain standing as we share Psalm 8, verses 1 through 5, found on page 743 of your hymnal. O Lord, our Lord, Your glory is chanted above the heavens by the mouth of babes and infants. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Yet you have made them little less than God. moments and pass the peace among yourselves. You will take your seat and uh, let's look at our inside cover of our bulletin. <clears throat> All right, we're glad you're here. Look at let's look at the life of the church. Jeff is out this week and asked me to do this for him, so I am. Uh, Keith is headed to Florida uh, to meet uh, I think Tracy and crew, and he and Anthony were going down there and. They're going to enjoy a week of sun in the fun, or fun in the sun. Uh, and then Ashley is not feeling well. She's out, but her wedding is next weekend. So if any of y'all are preparing to go down there, it's an early morning wedding. Um, but we had a great night at Galloway night this past week. A lot of children were here, a lot of parents. Uh, very good service and fun time of fellowship and all. Uh, no evening service this evening. I know there'll be droves turned away and saddened by that, but just the way it is. And uh, if you didn't know, our youth are doing a bake sale. Uh, today is the last one before we go on our youth trip in a few weeks. And here are some of the items. Deer sausage biscuits. They're gone. Okay. Well, they were there. Chicken spaghetti. Uh, loaded mashed potato casserole. Baked beans, mac and cheese, blueberry bread, blueberry muffins, chess squares, cookies, brownies, turtle brownies. I think those have a hard shell on them. Um, Mexican dip and salsa. And then, I'm really not sure how these got into the uh, bake sale, but lotion bars, body scrubs, and detoxing bath salts. Not real sure about that, but hey, you never know. So if you would like to support our youth downstairs after this worship service, there's also going to be a meeting of the folks that are on the Wells Fest committee uh, downstairs as well. So uh, if you're part of that group, please be sure you are at the meeting. Uh, June the 5th, we'll observe our 90th anniversary. We've got a lot of things going on. We're going to do a... Uh, Historical perspective, if you will, starting at 10 o'clock in here. There'll be no early service or Sunday school. 
Then uh, we'll do that for about 45 minutes at 11 o'clock. We'll have a worship service. We'll eat about 12.15. Come back upstairs about 1.30 for a hymn sing. And, uh, and we'll be done about 2.15, 2.30 at the latest. So hope you can be there. And if you know any other Wells members that are not living here any longer, invite them to come back. We'll have some, uh, we'll have some other special guests that day as well. And a very special announcement on that day about about something that's going to happen here at Wells. So you want to be there for that. Uh, if you've got any graduates that you want recognized by the church, please uh, fill out a pew card and put that in the offering plate or send an email to admin at wellschurch.org and we'll get those taken care of. Uh, the flowers today by Snooky Bauer in celebration of her children and grandchildren's birthday. And then the uh, flowers in the foyer, the Narthex, are for uh, Wilson and Ann celebrating their anniversary as well. And I think we've got another anniversary that we'll get to in a few minutes, but there are there any more announcements? Okay. We're still taking applications for the Day Starts program. If you'd also like to help with lunch, please let us know as soon as possible. We're trying to wrap that up uh, so that we have all our ducks in a row uh, before we start. So that's June 6th. And if they go to day stores, they'll learn how to play the tambourine. <laughs> shake it. And shake it right. Shake, shake, shimmy, and roll. Other announcements? Okay, let's go to prayer request. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, Mark. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. Oh, wow. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Greg. You got it, man. Former uh, member here with Al and Kyle, uh, Beth, Mitty, Beth, they live at Barrel, somewhere down there now. So anyway, he died this afternoon. Okay. All right, yeah. Yeah, we've been praying for him. Mark? Uh, prayer and thanksgiving. Judy and Corey are back here for some Yeah. Very yeah. really nice. All right, well, let's pause for a few moments and pray. God, it's a powerful thing when people share what's on their heart and their needs. And we're obligated as brothers and sisters in Christ to remember those requests and to pray daily for them. So help us to be ever mindful and ever hopeful. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Birthdays, anniversaries. Birthdays. Uh, my dad will be celebrating his 96th birthday tomorrow. Okay. All right. Mark? My sister Ellen will be taking care of Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, Keith. Oh, wow, okay, cool. Diane. Yeah, Diane will be celebrating 35 years. I was graduating high school and they were getting married. <laughs> we'll come up and do the blessing in just a moment then. Yeah, Kevin. I mean, Steve. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. All right, we'll sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you and keep you. Happy birthday to you. 
Come forward if you want to be a part of the blessing. God, I know it may be trite and cliche, but love is a many splendored thing. And we're grateful for love that's shared by a couple for 35 plus years. For the children that they brought into this world whom they love dearly and care for deeply. For the people that they have become. And for their life together and many days to come, we pray, Father. Keep your hand upon them that they may feel your spirit always. Join me now as we pray. Holy Spirit of God, Holy Spirit of God, you give us love, you give us love, and you give us hope, you give us hope, and you give us faith, and you give us faith. Thank you for those three things in this family. Thank you for those three things in this family, and the many more that make their worlds go around. And the many more that make their worlds go around. Be with them this year. Be with them this year. And the years to come. In the name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. The ushers will come forward, please. Let's pray. God, all that we have comes from you. And you ask us to, to give an offering when you've given everything. Help us to give what you call each of us to give in our own way. And to give with a cheerful heart. In the name of Christ, amen.
So for those of you visiting, um, we don't normally shake and shimmy on a Sunday morning. Um, it's the gospel in show music month. We, we believe that we can find God in, even in the secular things. There's uh, sometimes when the modern church is not speaking uh, the language of the people and uplifting us, we find it in uh, other areas. Um, I am not Ashley, um, and uh, so I'm pinch hitting for her this morning, so uh, bear with me. Just the way you planned It's funny But the bells don't ring It's a quiet thing When you hold the world trembling hands you'd think you hear a choir sing it's a quiet thing there are no exploding fireworks Where's the roaring of the crowd? Maybe it's the strange new atmosphere Way up here among the clouds But I don't hear the drums I don't hear the band the sounds I'm told such notions bring happiness comes in on tiptoe well what do you know? It's a quiet thing A very quiet thing Really sure what bear with you means on that. You did a great job. Good stuff. Is this working? Can y'all hear? Um, two sex, yes. That's all right. If you will look on the back of your order of service. The crux of the message comes today from the Romans passage, so I'll share that one with you. By faith we have been made acceptable to God, and now because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live at peace with God. Christ has also introduced us to God's undeserved kindness on which we take our stand. So we are happy as we look forward to sharing in the glory of God. But that's not all. We gladly suffer because we know that suffering helps us to endure. And endurance builds character, which gives us hope that will never disappoint 
us. All of this happens because God has given us the Holy Spirit who fills our hearts with love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How are we transformed into something creative and positive when we think about these verses of Scripture? Raise your hand if you like to suffer. Bob Caskey was in my office this morning, and because of some medical conditions he has, he had a surgery a couple weeks ago, but was unable to use any anesthesia. How'd that feel, Bob? Oh, man, it hurt. You know, My mom, God love her, all 81 years old of her. When she goes to the dentist, she doesn't use the Novocaine. Go figure. Some people choose to suffer. And other things that happen in our life cause us suffering and pain. So how can we be creative and positive during those times of suffering? A mentor of mine responded this way when I asked him the ad old question, why do good things happen to bad people? Actually, why do bad things happen to good people? He looked at me and he said simply this, I don't know, but I do know what happens when bad things happen to good people. They become better people. And I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. It's only through adversity that Christians become people better in their character and in their walk. As we live lives of what I call greater integrity, closer to the life that Jesus lived, we find that maybe we have the same hope that Christ had. Two of the most important doctrines of our faith are found in this passage of Scripture. Justification and sanctification. Justification means putting our trust in a power and goodness in God whose grace gives us peace instead of sinful conflict between God's will and our will. It also transforms your moral character. We're not only change, but we find it better to help other people when we have been through similar experiences. When our son was going through cancer treatments, it was always a blessing to hear or have a call or on Caring Bridge sites, somebody just to shoot a quick note of hope. I called them envelopes of light because they remind us that though this pain and suffering is temporary, it's very real. But at the end, when the journey's complete, you're healed. I think that's a lot what happens to us as Christians. And we talk about sanctification. It means that the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. You're sanctified. Kind of like the old Commodore song. Remember that? Sanctified, sanctified. Say, I feel sanctified. Some of you are nodding like this. Others are going, what the heck is he talking about? You know? Not that old. Uh. I hear you, brother. Look on the back of your order of service real quick. Look at verse 15 in John chapter 16 right there. Everything that the Father has is mine. That is why I have said that the Spirit takes my message and tells it to you. The disciples had a hard time understanding what the Spirit was going to do. And I think us as as Christians, that's the hardest thing we identify with. We get God and we get Jesus. But the Holy Spirit is kind of like, is it a Holy Ghost or what is it? You know, Jan had a great testimony this morning of the Spirit inside of her speaking to her, telling her what she felt the Spirit wanted her to do. Even three years after teaching the disciples about love and about grace and about hope, Jesus knew they still weren't ready to hear some of the lessons that he could teach them. So he promised that the Spirit would come and that the Spirit would instruct them and fill them to do the right things. Now, I think the Holy Spirit gets blamed for a lot of stuff that we want to do ourselves. You know, it's kind of like Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. You know, I think the devil gets way too much credit when it's really the devil in us, you know. I think God could have shared the Ten Commandments with, with Adam or Abraham. 
But for whatever reason, God shared the Ten Commandments with Moses. Perhaps previous generations wouldn't have been able to understand it, to bear the law. And maybe that's why Jesus waited till Pentecost for the Holy Spirit to come upon them all with the fullness of what the Spirit is. When I was younger, I saw God in a certain way. I don't see God the same way now because I have new insights and, and new things that have spoken to me and made me and formed and fashioned me into the fullness of what I'm supposed to be that steadily evolves every day. When my heart-worn hope gets hoped out, I'm reminded of what God has done in the past, and I know that I'm going to make it. My hope is built on nothing less. Think about it. You may find that the Spirit reveals that some of your previous ideas about the Bible, church, Jesus, and others, were incomplete. Maybe they were even wrong. I know some of the things I learned just aren't right. And we still cling to some of those exclusive, rigid teachings. Here's what I know. Don't be surprised when your understandings of Scripture, God, Jesus, Christianity, faith, etc., don't be surprised when those current understandings change because important times of change means that God is still speaking to you and that nothing is set in stone other than this. God is love and will never cease to be. When the world says give up, hope whispers Try it one more time. Try it one more time. I read a quote this week from Einstein, you know, because I read him a lot. <laughs> he said, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is not to stop questioning. You see, what, what I see a lot of people that run out of hope, they quit questioning because they think they know all the answers. And that's really not how it works. In closing this morning, I'll ask you this particular question. Does being a Christian set us apart from the rest of the human race or does it help us to join it? Does your faith enable you to be a, a part of the human race and join it unwaveringly? You see, here's the deal. Paul wrote this, this text. And he had certainly undergone some suffering at this time. And, and by the writing on the wall, and if you read the rest of his letters, you know that he's got a lot more suffering to come. But he tries to talk about it as he sees the church in Rome are struggling with suffering as well. And I don't know if he really convinced them. I'm not sure he really convinced me, but I'm trying. I'm holding out for hope. I'm coming at this from what I hope is the, the end of a bunch of anxiety that I have. I get anxious. I don't listen to the words of Paul in Philippians that say, be anxious about nothing, but everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Jesus Christ. Folks, I can recite that verse all day long, but I still get anxious. But there's something about every day you fight through it. That maybe every day when you fight a little bit tougher, overcome those things in your life that you're hoping to overcome. Maybe what you're building is character, endurance, that give you hope, that promise hope forever. These words ring very true from Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
We seek this hope not because we are in search of some private religious experience that will make us feel secure or holy. We seek it because in this self-forgetting, gazing towards the light of God in Christ, we learn how to look at one another and the whole of God's creation. And it allows us to see the created reality for what is truly the sight of God, rather than what terms used to dominate our lives. Hope. I promise you this, and I know it to be true. God is with each of us right now. Closer to you than the air that you're breathing in and exhaling. You don't have to chase after God. Simply be with God. Let God's spirit fill you and guide you to do the things that God is calling you to do. Take joy in knowing that God is walking with you and will never leave your side. My mother-in-law, God rest her soul, used to cross-stitch. We still got different pieces in our home of her works. But when I got my first real job out of seminary, she made me something, and it's the footprints for it all cross-stitched and about this long. And I love it because the very last sentence in the whole poem is when you only saw one set of footprints, it's then that I was carrying you. If that can't give you hope, I don't know what can. Amen, and thanks be to God. I invite you to stand now as we sing verse 1 of hymn 368, My hope is built on nothing less. Jan will be back in the back alcove with the uh, elements of communion. If you would like to partake, please do. Uh, Keith consecrated them before they left, so they're good to go. All right? All right. Join hands as we sing our benediction song.